So, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you've all been enjoying this really delicious lunch at this uh, really lovely venue. And a big thank you to the Grand Hyatt for such a, a lovely um, meal today. Um, so, my name is Alison Beale. I'm the director of the University of Oxford Japan office. And I'm also the vice president of the British Chamber of Commerce um, here in Japan. So, the title of today's discussion is Breaking with Tradition, Kishida's New Tide on Diplomacy, Capitalism and Japan's Future. We have a really, really wonderful panel of experts here today to talk about this theme. Um, so, I would like to um, introduce them briefly uh, to you now. So, um, from my left, um, Kazuo Kodama, who is president of the Foreign Press Center in Japan. Andriana Cetkovic, president and CEO of Brio Nexus. Svetkovic, very sorry. <laughs> and also Ken Shibasawa, the um, CEO of Shibasawa and Company. So, Andriana, Shibasawa san, Kodama san, we're really, really delighted to have you uh, here today and we're really looking forward to this uh, discussion. So, we're going to um, talk. Um, at the beginning, we're going to have a conversation um, in the first uh, few um, minutes of this panel discussion, and then there'll be lots of time for um, your questions. So please, um, I'll, I'll very keen to hear um, questions from the floor um, as we move on. Fumio Kishida took up office as Prime Minister in October 2021 following a record-breaking uh, long term by Shinzo Abe and actually a surprisingly quite short term of Yoshihide Suga. Suga's premiership was somehow dogged by controvers controversy over the, um, his administration's handling of the um, COVID pandemic, pandemic and um, in uh, comparison to that, I think Kishida has in some ways been somewhat luckier um, with um, COVID being in retreat. He's also um, seen his popularity buoyed by um, his quite strong stance on Russia's invasion of Ukraine and his um, speaking out um, to oppose Putin. So, in fact, Kishida has been enjoying really high levels of um, approval rates in his cabinet, which has been, I think, for a long time, it's been over 50%, although I hear it's slightly declined um, a little bit recently. So, early on um, in his tenure, he announced a grand design for a new form of cat capitalism, and more details have been coming out uh, about this, particularly over um, this month. Next month... Um, as Sarah mentioned, we're going to see the upper house elections. And um, although I think it's widely expected that Kishida will um, lead the LDP to um, a comfortable uh, majority, um, of course, you never know. And then the question is, what happens next? So all of these are some of the issues that we're planning to talk about um, today. So... Um, to kick off, then, um, I would like to start with a question to Ken Shibasawa, to Shibasawa-san. So, Ken Shibasawa is the um, CEO of Shibasawa and & Company, and he's also a senior advisor for Brunswick. Um, and um, Shibasawa and & Company is a strategic advisory firm for alternative investments, ESG and SDGs alignment, and human resource development. He's also a member of Prime Minister Kishida's special committee, the New Capitalism Panel, which makes him the perfect person to answer my first question, which is, what exactly is Kishida's New Capitalism? <laughs> so, <laughs> Shibasawa, may I invite you to speak for, um, for, for five minutes or so about this topic? Thank you, Alison. Uh, thank you, everybody, the uh, Chamber of Commerce, <coughs> to uh, invite me for this uh, event. Uh, I have to apologize. I don't have the new, uh, the correct form of English because I was born <laughs> in Japan, but I spent my time in the United States uh, all the way through from second grade to uh, college and came to work here back in Japan. Um, the, the new form of capitalism, <coughs> um, from the outset, you know, everybody's saying, well, what, what's so new about it? What is it? And 
initially the, the rhetoric, rhetoric was the fact that it, there was a, is it distribution or, or is, is it growth? Which is it? Is it the growth strategy or a distribution um, a policy? And, and the important uh, takeaway from there is it's not distribution or growth, but it's distribution and growth and forming a virtuous cycle. <clears throat> that, that, that's what, was, what, what the uh, Prime Minister was trying to, to uh, accomplish. Um, but then there was lots of criticism <clears throat> or concerns about what, what that meant. Uh, when you think about distribution policy, it, it kind of sounds like big government, you know, is it, it's you know, a new form of capitalism, that's, that's socialism. Um, and a lot of the criticism and concerns um, also was comparing it to the Abenomics, which remember started in 2012. Um, and frankly, I think the foreign media tends to focus on this a lot when I get when I when I ask for interviews. It is a, you know, it's a new form of capitalism, um, something that's critical of, of Abenomics. And, and and my answer is well, no, because if you think about it, <coughs> Abe-san and Kishida-san is the is the head of the same party. It wasn't like the party chain flip sides, right? Um, so it's obvious that the new head of the LDP is not going to flip <coughs> the policy made by his predecessors. Um, and Abenomics was initiated around 2013, 14, 2012, 13, 14. And if you remember back then, um, it was right after the 311 uh, Fukushima incident, um, the world had lost confidence in Japan. Asset prices were all deflated. <coughs> Um, Abenomics came in, um, and basically it was, it was the three arrows, right? If you remember that, um, I, I said it was one big bazooka. <coughs> it, was, it, it was the BOJ's, you know, uh, uh, new, the, what is it called in English? But it was just super, super, uh, you know, uh, easy monetary policy, um, and it worked. <coughs> and it's not just in, in Japan, but all over the world, uh, there was a move towards easy uh, monetary policy and asset prices increased. We saw market caps of uh, you know, markets and companies reaching new highs. So there's, there was lots of wealth created. So obviously that policy back then was very critical for Japan. Um, but if you look back <coughs> in hindsight, there was this growth, there was this asset price increase, um, but at the same time, there was lots of social disparity. The, the wealth creation, people that enjoyed the wealth was not, was not equal. Um, so maybe it's difficult to say uh, cause and effect <coughs> between easy monetary policy and social disparity, but at least you can say there was a, there's a pretty strong correlation. So why Mr. Uh, Prime Minister Kishida was, wants the new form of capitalism, he, he calls it a version up, <coughs> upgrade. And that makes sense to me because like Abenomics did its thing, it was great, but th there, needs, there needs to be some upgrades. And the upgrade, the version up is the fact that there are a lot of things being left behind. These are the externalities. Um, this word externality, um, Kishida-san was very clear in an article he wrote um, at the Bungei Shinju <coughs> back in February. He also did a very good speech, I felt, in London. He addressed those externalities but it's never picked up by the media very much. And, and probably usually because externalities, it's, it's a little bit complicated. In, in Japanese, it's called gaibufkezai, and it's, like, it's, it's a very complicated word, right? And, and people like easy answers. But what, what are the externalities? It's the environment, it's the, you know, it's the social dis disparity, th things like that. And so he, he says clearly in that the new form of capitalism is all about incorporating this externalities that were left behind back into capitalism. So it's not, it's not, it's not a denial of capitalism, but it's more of an inclusive form of capitalism. So when you use the word inclusive capitalism, is that new? No, it's not new. But I believe for this new era, new current era, I think it's a very, very uh, important uh, step <coughs> uh, that the Prime Minister is taking. Um, when you get down to the how you're going to achieve this inclusive form of capitalism, that, that's when you know that's when the, uh, it gets a little bit more. Uh, you need to go more, more into detail. But at the opening, I just want to go through the conceptual <coughs> level. Why why do we need a new form of capitalism right now? 
because we need inclusivity to have sustainable growth, uh, in, in not just in Japan, but in the world. Yeah. That's interesting. And in terms of um, some of the, the kind of ways that he plans to do this, can you give a bit more um, example of? Sure. Um, he's a politician, right? <clears throat> and so he wants, he wants votes. And so what, what, what's, a, what's a clean message for the people? Wage increase, right? <clears throat> So that, so that, that, was, on, that was initially uh, uh, on the agenda. Um, and basically what it is, is if you think about it, in, in Japan, the last 30 years, wages have, hasn't increased at all. It's okay because prices didn't go up at all, so, so we were fine. But now we're in a situation where global prices are going up. In Japan, it's still relatively stable, but you know, it's creeping up. And if, the, you know, and if the wages are not growing, then obviously we have a big problem, political problem. Not, not, not just a political problem, but a social problem. Um, so the, the timing that he came up <clears throat> with increasing wages, I, I think it's very timely and it's very, very important. Um, and I think the, uh, the corporate sector in Japan, not just the large companies, but the smaller media SMEs as well, is more receptive to, to you know, increasing wages. Uh, to, 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 because basically increasing wages is seen as a, you know, a, a sustainable way of, of growth um, here in Japan. And so that phrase is, was transformed in this, uh, in Japanese, shitoe no toshi, investing in the people. So in a sense, new form of capitalism is looking at, I think, I believe, human capital, which is a very, very important part of, of capitalism. But, but up until now, we value companies basically on the financial <coughs> value, which is, you can put a number on it. Um, but when you talk about human capital, yeah, you can put the number on a wage, but wages are usually seen as a cost, <coughs> not as capital, right? Um, but in the long term, in the long term, obviously, if you're put, putting input into the people, you're investing the people, it obviously should lead to, you know, the sustainable growth of a company. So um, there's lots of different parts in, in this uh, uh, in the grand design, but if you had to put one sort of <coughs> critical uh, important theme on it. Uh, it it's, he wants to focus on the people. Great. And um, there's lots in there that I think we, we want to pick up in the, um, in the course of uh, this discussion. Um, I'd next, though, I'd like to turn to another of our expert panelists, actually um, Kodama-san. Um, Kazuo Kodama is the president of the Por Foreign Press Center and he's had a very long and distinguished career with the Japanese Foreign Service, including postings as Deputy Permanent Representative to the United Nations, Japanese Ambassador to the OECD, and most recently Japanese Ambassador to um, the European uh, Union. So Kodama-san, welcome um, to the Chamber of Commerce today. And, um, so what I'd like to ask you is, um, based on your um, very long experience um, working overseas, um, what do you think of the? Um, what are your thoughts on the direction of the Japan's economy? And do you think um, Kishida's new capitalism is what is needed to pull the Japanese com um, economy out of um, its so-called lost decades? Is this is this an answer to the Japanese economy? Again, please um, give your thoughts, share your thoughts on this issue. Uh, first of all, thank you, Alison, for your kind introduction. And uh, let me first, of course, uh, tell you, um, thank you for having me for this event. Um, thanks to the BCCJ in Japan. Now, um, let me start uh, with, the, you asked me to tell the audience that the, the direction of the global economy. Now, by sharing you uh, the OECD's most recent, actually, um, uh, comment on this. Uh, actually, this was issued only early this month. First, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine immediately slowed the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic and set the global economy on a course of, yes, lower growth and rising inflation. Second, this means global growth to decelerate Indeed, yes, decelerate, slow down to around 3% this year, 2022, and 2.8% 2023, 
well below the recovery projected last December. Thirdly, the large and global uh, impact this war uh, is having on inflation, which has already reached 40-year highs in Germany, the UK, and the United States, but not in Japan. Uh, fourthly, the economic and social impact of the war is strongest again in Europe, not in Japan, uh, with many of the countries hardest hit in Europe, including the UK, given exposure through energy imports and refugee in inflows. So, in a nutshell, high inflation is eroding household incomes and spending. So, so much for the OECD um, you know, comment. Now, I'd like to point out on two uh, macroeconomic uh, fronts, Japan's economic situation is divergent. I say divergent from those in the US or Europe. Yet, it is true, it is true that the COVID-19 and the Russian invasion of Ukraine have adversely, adversely affected Japan, just like any other advanced countries, economies. Yet, uh, there exist, I say, the two big divergences with other advanced economies, including the US and Europe. One is the strength of economic recovery. Now, Japan's annual GDP growth in 2022, this year, is expected to be just 1.7%. Now, the weakest, I say weakest, of, again, amongst the OECD countries, 37 members, except Finland and Estonia. I can, you can imagine, because again, Finland and Estonia are the also hardest hit because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now, for information, US 2.46, UK 3.64, France 2.36, Germany 1.86, Euro 17, 2.62, Japan 1.7. Also on inflation, Japan is still struggling with its famous chronic deflation uh, with weak wage pressures. Bank of Japan, the monetary policy so remains, well, what the economists say, accommodative. Accommodative, yes. So it remains to be very lax. Now, on Japan's economic outlook as of June, again, OECD concludes the higher commodity prices will push headline inflation up to nearly 2.5% by late 2022, well below OECD average. Inflation is projected to remain uh, low, uh, partly reflecting weak wage growth. Now, the finally, I just want to, so to recap, uh, the difficulty confronting Japan uh, is to address two frontal, two frontal policy challenges simultaneously, namely to support still fragile economic recovery from chronic deflation with QQE on one hand, and to adopt measures to contain so-called acute inflation, exacerbated by both the war in Ukraine and the rapid depreciation of, yes, indeed, of yen values on the other. Yes, there seems no quick fixes to these policy challenges. Yet, I'd like to point out that because of acute inflation, at long last, there appears signs that, firstly, Japanese household inflation expectations, inflation expectations are rising. And secondly, they are becoming more tolerant of inflation than before. I know uh, Governor Kuroda was criticized when he said in, in the parliament, Japanese seems to be getting more tolerant of the inflation. But I think that is true. According to an international survey, let me finally just give you the figures, okay? To convince you, you may disagree with me, um, on Japanese or people's inflation expectations, including Japan, US, UK, Germany, and Canada, okay? Very interesting uh, change of Japanese consumers' expectations. Now, they were all asked, okay? 
what do you think will happen to process in over, to prices uh, in over the next year compared to today between in August, they were asked in August 2021, and the same question in April, this April. Now, questions, uh, answers are five alternatives. Will increase a lot, will increase slightly, will remain more or less unchanged, will decrease slightly, will decrease a lot. Now, August last year, Japanese consumers' answers, you know, the answers stand out on two accounts. First, while other nations expect prices will increase a lot between 30 to 40 percent, less than 10 percent of Japanese expect it. Big difference. Now, second, those Japanese who answered prices will remain more or less unchanged, numbered 30 percent, while other nations remained between 10 to 15 percent. So Japanese inflation expectation remained low in October 2021. But interestingly, the same question was asked in this April. Okay? The Japanese, uh, you know, the, their expectation of inflation. Now Japanese this time joined other nations expecting prices will remain a lot with just 40 percent. 43 percent US, 57 UK, Germany 56 and also Japanese who answered prices will remain more or less unchanged, you know, numbered just 80%. Big decrease. And then, well, finally, I think, um, the Japan, uh, well, the, yes, so Japanese, my point is Japanese household inflation expectations are rising. Maybe they are becoming more tolerant of you know, inflation. So this, the final piece of puzzle, this puzzle is the expectation on the, well, the wage rise. But in order for that to happen, I think the economists like Professor Tsutomu Watanabe, who is a very now a prominent professor, I think, expert on prices analysis, empirical studies of prices in Japan and its movement, I think this will give a, a the freedom uh, to the companies to, to decide prices. See, pricing power is now, is, is, will be given to the Japanese companies. Then, again, as I think um, yes, Shibasawa-san said, what the Prime Minister Kishida's expectation, that virtuous cycle of a maybe, yes, uh, rise in income, and then I think, you know, uh, the, uh, the rise in um, uh, wages, and then this, this you know, virtual cycle will kick in. Thank you. I stop here. Right. Great. Yeah, thank you. So um, you seem to have quite an optimistic view of, of this, and you think that Kishida's policies are yes. on track. Good. I think we should, we again, um, come back and... Yes. Just, just uh, well, yes. But of course, a, uh, let me just add one thing. Uh, this um, cycle of a inflation expectation, and then Japanese are getting more of a torrent of inflation, and then uh, companies uh, will feel more, uh, feel freer to raise uh, prices. That will, of course, set in this uh, virtual cycle. However, of course, other challenges, yes, investment in, in human resources, and then also the redistribution of, of I think um, the income or uh, asset or income, I think, remain also a very important piece of his, I think, the new capitalism. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So I'd like to pick up um, on these ideas with our third expert panelist, and I'm um, delighted to introduce Andriana Zvetkovic, who's the president and CEO of Brio Nexus. So Andriana was the former ambassador to the Republic of Macedonia to Japan and also until recently served as the Director of Corporate Networks for North Asia for The Economist Group. Andriana, again, welcome to this um, panel. Um, so we've heard about um, Kishida's um, aspirations. We've also heard a very optimistic outlook from um, Kodama-san. So I'd like to turn to you next and ask um, a bit more generally and pick up some of the issues that we've talked about to ask you what you think are the key issues that Japan has to grapple with 
um, going for forward. And maybe in your answer, if you could um, maybe think particularly in terms of us as businesses here. Thank you, Alison, and thank you very much for inviting me and having me here at uh, this wonderful uh, discussion. Um, I was very uh, inspired by the exposes of our two uh, panelists today, and, and uh, which made me think uh, of a couple of issues. Um, of course, we have a new prime minister since last year, and uh, we're going to have elections now, and uh, we are in the pre-election period, so we can hear a lot of discussion in the public arena of what will be the priorities going forward. And I think um, this period, in pre-election period, will also influence Prime Minister Kishida's plan for the next three years, because in the next three years won't be any other election. Uh, and from what we can uh, see uh, on his agenda, there are lots of things. Uh, namely, I had a session in January uh, with the head of uh, public policy at the cabinet office, Mr. Shikata, at the Economist Group on this topic. And I can see from that time to now, this the new capitalism uh, agenda, including the priorities for Prime Minister Kishida, have changed. How they have changed? Well, we have a um, war in Europe, uh, the Russian and Ukrainian war, that has influenced in, in a great deal, not only geopolitical developments and how um, leaders around the world, including the leader in Japan, are prioritizing international relations, including defense spending, but also uh, this war um, affecting energy prices, inflation, wheat prices. The wheat prices has gone 56% on global level. Import prices in Japan, uh, 20 to 30%. Uh, energy uh, has gone over the roof, even uh, depending on which source of energy you're talking about, and depending on the country, the uh, percentage is more than 100% increase. However, in Japan, inflation is about 2%, uh, the cons consumer price index 2.5% compared to US 8.9%. And why is this so? Well, the um, secret is called suppressing measures and elevating measures by the Japanese government. So the Japanese government has been subsidizing the uh, price uh, to not go so high, not to hit the consumer. And uh, there has been separate, separate budgets that uh, they have influenced these prices, including uh, subsidizing the wheat prices and agricultural products. So in Japan, you, ha you can see only 10% increase of these commodity prices while in the world, as I mentioned, 20 to 30% depending on the grain. For energy, is the same. Japan is um, more than 90% dependent on uh, energy exports, uh, and it's one of the countries that has the lowest self-sufficiency in the OECD countries, only 11%. Actually, it's much higher than where it was, about 6.8% 10 years ago. Uh, so Japan really needs to uh, tackle and answer many uh, critical issues on defense. Uh, Japan is increasingly thinking about the safety and security in the region. Uh, having uh, seen what happened in, 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 in Russia and uh, in Ukrainian relations and the possibility of that repeating in Japan. So defense spending will go 2%. That's um, going double from 1% of GDP spending uh, because uh, Japan feels the pressure to um, behave and act in the spirit of the NATO countries. Mainly, you will have for the first time on the NATO summit in Madrid um, this week, uh, we will have the first uh, time the Prime Minister of Japan, uh, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand uh, attending, simply because they are united um, related to common threats. Well, this 2% over five years, of course, now becomes part of the priorities of uh, uh, Kishida's um, administration. However, uh, will Prime Minister Kishida be able to secure a um, simple majority or maybe a bigger majority to support his policies? Because including this defense policy and uh, others are not widely supported by uh, coalition partners like Komeito. However, has gained for the first time 
support by the Japanese public. 50% of Japanese public approve of this spending and approve of, approve of uh, increasing the capabilities, including the countermeasure uh, capabilities of uh, Japanese defense. Some of the things that you said what businesses should be uh, thinking and concentrating uh, on, I think there are many positive uh, things that I can pick up from Kishida's agenda going forward. Uh, one, I think uh, Ken mentioned, uh, the focus will be on people and human capital. Investing in human capital, that's something that Japan really needs through skilling, reskilling, uh, education, upskilling, uh, especially the target for the digitalization. Japan by 2050 plans to produce 2.5 million um, uh, workers in the IT industry with a focus on women. I'm a little bit skeptical in how Japan will go about delivering that target because it's, um, it's easy to say but it's much harder to do. Uh, and then uh, I'm thinking one of maybe one of the things that Prime Minister Kishida will um, probably be thinking more or should be thinking more about structural changes. Uh, as um, uh, Shibusawa-san and uh, Kotama-san said, this is a continuation of Kishida's capitalism, new capitalism, in many ways the continuation of uh, Prime Minister Abe agenda on the fiscal and monetary. However, the structural changes is what has not been implemented or fully implemented under uh, Prime Minister Abe. And uh, how will Prime Minister Kishida uh, tackle the structural changes? Most important structural changes is the demographic change and the labor reform change. Uh, Japan has one third of the population over 65, and uh, that, uh, that's one in four person, it's over 65 now. And uh, by 2060, it's going to be one uh, for every person um, uh, under 60, there'll be a person on the 60. And that alone will decrease the GDP for 0.8 percent, the demographic. Uh, think alone. Another thing is um, the female participation, which I think has not been um, sufficiently addressed in the new capitalism um, agenda that should take a more stronger place and more prominent place. Uh, of course, I as a woman, but it also makes much more sense uh, for the economy to be including uh, women, to also be extending uh, the life work span of the um, elderly over 65. Um, you know, there are even uh, suggestions, suggestions in Japan that there shouldn't be any cap or um, uh, retirement age, which I agree with because um, it, the, the age uh, situation is not only unique for Japan. We have a situation in South Korea and China, and uh, when we are talking, thinking about growth and distribution, uh, we should definitely be focusing on uh, how we're going to utilize the human capital from uh, the young age to the uh, older age, including uh, maybe abolishing the seniority system and introducing productivity-based wages, which will contribute towards uh, more uh, stronger productivity, something which Japan is currently grappling with. But I'll stop here and I'm looking forward to uh, discussion. Yeah, great. So um, you've brought up many um, different um, issues that the country is facing. Are you, say, are you, in general, are you optimistic about the way we are moving in Japan? I am uh, very, very optimistic. And um, I have to say, I really admire Prime Minister Kishida's ambitious plan. Uh, in his new capitalism, there are lots of things that um, I really would like to see happen, if not in the next three years, but uh, let's say in the next uh, five, 10 years, especially uh, things related to investment, startups, digitalization, the new um, garden, um, digital garden nation a project that would like to include not only bigger cities but also uh, small, uh, smaller cities and regions in Japan. Um, I just would like to stay a little bit cautious about which, will, which priorities will Prime Minister uh, Kishida take first because that will set the tone uh, for the uh, many projects or many priorities going uh, forward and um, to have a successful term, I think um, Prime Minister will really have to have the support uh, from everyone in the society, especially young people, that they have not been very interested in politics, they have not uh, had a high buy-in into um, the new capitalism, uh, so um, finding ways how to engage young people and get their support and get them motivated or like 
re-instigate um, the major era spirit is something that we really need in Japan today. Thank you. I want to leave um, lots of time at the end for, for questions. Um, but before I open up to the floor for everyone's questions, I'd like to talk um, a little bit with the panel about the upcoming um, Upper House elections and thoughts on um, what's going to happen. So may I, I'd like to ask your opinion on what you think will happen um, in the, um, A, in the elections. And I think there's probably not a huge amount of, I guess, surprises in your answers. But um, one thing I'd like to ask is, do you think there'll be a big change in Kishida after the elections? I think at the moment he's got a reputation for being quite soft, quite malleable, he's quite um, popular. Um, is he waiting out his time and then after these elections he'll make a move to, to, to maybe some more aggressive um, policies? Um, thoughts on what will happen at the elections and how that will influence Japanese politics afterwards? Um, Ken, would you like to start? Sure. Um, a year ago from today, nobody, including myself, thought that the Prime Minister would be Kishida-san. Um, so he, in strokes of luck and in, in a situation, he found himself to be Prime Minister in October. Obviously, there's lots of political, uh, I would say, I guess, bargaining. <coughs> um, and, and so if you, when you saw the... Uh, the senior membership of the LDP that he that he named the cabinet. Obviously, there's lots of lots of uh, uh, factional <coughs> over the faction kind of kind of uh, uh, coordination. Um, when I was named on the council, actually the council going back, to, it's it's a very diverse council. Half of the 15 people on the council are women, and a couple of them are in their 30s startups, and so that, there was a it was a very um, that was the first time I felt <clears throat> that Shida-san showed his color, that it was his choice to have that, those, those kind of members. But at the end of the last year, when I was going through the, the, you know, the, the, the initial stages of the new form of capitalism, myself included, says, what's, what's so new about this? And the reason why it wasn't anything new was because they had to pass the supplementary budget at the end of the last year, and so it was something that's been in the works for the government for a long time for the year, and so basically they had to pass it. And the new form of capitalism was sort of a platform for it to <clears throat> do that. Um, I felt back then that he was driving very, very carefully, obviously because he was his, his political foundation within the party wasn't all that strong then. Um, I was hoping back then, since I was on this panel for new form of capitalism, that it would last more than three months. <laughs> so, so I was hoping that, that, well, maybe what he needs to do is go, well, Actually, initially, he pa passed the lower house elections fairly well. <clears throat> and so I thought, well, the next thing is the upper house elections. And if he passes the upper house elections, then there's not a general election for the next three years. And so he could probably show his true color. Um, I started seeing changes with him, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, during the Ukraine crisis. Kind of started at the end of last year when there's, I'm sure you um, people in this audience was aware that Japan had a problem with accepting uh, foreign exchange students <clears throat> from abroad, that they weren't able to come into Japan. And I thought it was a pretty poor, poor showing for Japan towards the world. And so I, I made, some, um, made some issues with, with, with some people in the government. And, 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 it, and it actually reached the top part of, of, the, of the government. And they started easing that, if you remember. Um, with that background, I think must must have helped actually when Ukraine crisis came up, and there was a need for people that wanted to flee <coughs> the you know areas of conflict, and I was really surprised that Japan said, "Hey, you know, please please come to Japan." And I've never seen that before, and and that's when I felt like Shida-san kind of turned on his colors a little bit, and and. And basically, there was support for that, uh, public support for that here in Japan, and I think that probably solidifies the situation. Um, so he, gradually, <coughs> um, he, he is um, you know, forming his fo political foundation to be a long-standing prime minister. Currently, he's in Germany, right, with the G7. Um, if, he didn't if he didn't have confidence in his position, he wouldn't be there, I think. Because with the upper house elections coming, he has to be out there campaigning. The fact that he is in, he's in Germany um, feels, it just means like to me that he feels comfortable in his political foundation. 
Um, and by being in the G7, participating in NATO, <clears throat> that he could kind of start rising above, um, you know, what the expectations of what Kishida san in the outside world. Um, I think within the LDP, most people in the LDP, I think, feel that there won't be a problem in terms of you know, them losing a whole bunch of seats and with the Komeito that they'll have the majority. Um, I would imagine there are some concerns though within the LDP and that concern is that if the LDP wins too much, <coughs> then that really solidifies Kishida-san's positions and some of the other senior party members, I won't mention names, but, but they might feel a little bit uncomfortable that, that maybe the power shift <clears throat> from this you know, weak looking prime minister is, you know, is starting to look pretty, pretty solid. And so I'd like to see how much seats <clears throat> LDP can win for the separate house election. So in a sense, I'm, what I'm saying is that after the elections, Shida-san now has the ability to really turn on his true colors. Andriana Kodamathan. Andriana, would you like to? Yes, I think I, I agree with uh, what uh, Ken said. I had a, a great pleasure and honor in uh, actually being ambassador in Japan when um, uh, Prime Minister Kishida was uh, foreign minister at that time. And uh, I had a multiple occasions in meeting him and talking to him and I had a great um, deal of respect for him. And you know, when people say he's a good listener, uh, that I, I've actually experienced that so many times. It's not someone just will listen, he really internalized. And he is a person that will wait for the right moment to do the right, the, the right thing. Um, I think he has been navigating uh, the political spectrum uh, very good since he took office. He took office uh, after Prime Minister Suga. Um, and uh, after the pandemic, and he has stabilized, uh, in a way, a public opinion about the administration and the direction, and uh, has shown a much bolder approach towards international relations. In a way, uh, Kishida has sort of used his experience um, as a foreign minister to um, foster an even greater agenda for Japan in Asia, especially uh, ASEAN countries. And uh, as you, you know, uh, there was the um, ASEAN meeting uh, and uh, the Quad meeting in, in, in Japan and the, the, the meeting with pre uh, President Biden. And Japan is playing a crucial role in many of the initiatives that are happening in Asia. Uh, so um, I'm thinking after the election, uh, I can, I would expect to see much bolder leadership to continue with the bold leadership in international scene, but at the same time, uh, try to implement the policies that um, he wants to implement under uh, the new capitalism agenda. And we know that uh, there's already a um, uh, $77 billion budget that has been allocated and approved for uh, this uh, very ambitious undertaking. And of course, that's very important. Um, however, uh, in terms of uh, will Kishida change, I see 2022 until end of 22 as a year of actually um, economic crisis, to be honest. If you see the inflation um, everywhere in the world, OECD countries, US, Europe, energy prices, um, commodity prices really going through the roof. And we see uh, political instability almost all around uh, Europe. We have uh, elections coming up in, uh, in, the, in the US. So um, I, I would uh, think that Kishida will be uh, very cautious uh, going forward to sort of uh, tackle the issues, the economic issues. Um, the effect of the COVID, the effect of the, uh, the war and uh, the supply chain disruption, inflation, and then uh, more slowly and carefully start introducing the policies after this big wave of um, crisis is, uh, is passing. Because I think we have not, we have really seen the tip of the iceberg of uh, the inflation. Kodama-san. Well, um, Alison, uh, to be very frank with you, um, if I were still incumbent Japanese ambassador to somewhere, 
I would not dare uh, answering your question uh, <laughs> you know, on this question. However, I am now 100% just ordinary Japanese citizen. I have 100% freedom of speech, uh, even on this issue, so I will speak up. I can be very brief. Number one, arithmetic. Um, governing parties, LDP and Komeito, need to win just 56, five, six seats only to retain upper house majority of 100, 126 seats, okay? Now, um, according to the Yomiri Shimbun um, last week, um, the, the, the survey uh, took on 22 and 23rd of June, uh, voters' party preference. Interesting, I think it's very clear, for proportional election seats, okay? Um, LDP enjoys 36%, very big, and Komeito 6%. So governing parties uh, combined together, 42%. While the opposition parties start with the Constitutional Democratic Party, Rikke Minshu, only, I say, only 8%, very small. And then Nippon Ishin no Kai, Japan Restoration Party, bigger than uh, Rikke Minshu, 10%. So this is an interesting course situation. And then uh, National Democratic Party, Kokumi Minshuto, NDP, just 2%. And then Kyo Santo, Communist Party of Japan, 3%. So uh, with this, uh, Yomiri Shimbun actually just, this is not their judgment, but just a factual uh, finding, which says three years ago, the same upper house election, with the same level of support from the voters, okay? LDP won the election. It's as simple as that. And then I expect simply the governing parties will win this time again. And then finally, let me just, just a few, uh, maybe ask Q and A session, I think. Um, I would raise three important, I think, factors that will explain, explain why this being the case. Number one, uh, changing political attitudes among voters, especially young, younger voters. Um, the picture of so-called liberal-minded young people supporting the center-left and the conservative-minded voters supporting the center-right is no longer valid in Japan. Now, and then, um, second, the opposition parties remain in shambles. It is, I mean, since they lost power in 2012 general election, remember, when they won the power in 2009, they had 308, 308 seats in the lower house. Huge, huge you know, number. And then three, after three years and four months, they lost power, winning only 57 seats. And this happened even in a, unlike the UK system. You have fast passport system, you see? So winner takes all. Our system is in a way hybrid system. 50% a fast, uh, so a smaller constituency system. The remaining is still the um, proportional representation. Still, you see, the, um, the uh, but they had 308. So um, I say um, the still governing parties can win the election if they change themselves. And then finally, third, what is worrying, more worrying, I think, for me, or maybe for the older generation, is I think uh, the kind of a pervading sense of apathy. Pervading sense of apathy, always apathy is there in the United States, UK, Europe, Japan, everywhere. But in our case, I think this is felt by the younger people. And then Noah Snyder, you know, the economist, Tokyo bureau chief, he actually recently said to me, he was surprised to hear from young Japanese uh, voters. They said they will tell him their vote doesn't matter, that nothing ever changes, the same people always win, they cannot change the system, there is no point in participating. You see, these are not the kinds of things people say in functioning democracy. At least this is what uh, Noah told me. Thank you. So we've got some time now for um, questions. So I think we've got a mic. I can see a hand here. Hi, 
Thank you very much to the panelists and to Reese Sudan for a wonderful lunch. Um, with all respect to Japanese politicians who uh, obviously we need to support and uh, we need for them to do their best, what is Japan Inc. telling Japanese politicians? Um, what we know that uh, the position of the leading Japanese companies is often reflected in policy and in what Japanese politicians do. What is their focus and what is the focus that they're asking Japanese politicians to, to commit to? Do I take it? <clears throat> uh, thank you for the question. Um, I don't think there's a Japan Inc. anymore, actually. <laughs> well, I mean, the word exists, but there's lots of different companies that have different needs, and there's no one sort of direction, you know. Um, so that, that was a nice word that, we, that was used back in the 80s, but. <laughs> I'm sorry? Well, I mean, I, 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 was, I was in that <laughs> era as well. So, but, but I take your point. Um, and, and I think um, uh, there are two representatives of Japan Inc. on the panel, Keidan Ren Keizai Do Yukai, yes? Um, and the, the stance is basically, well, one stance was that if there's new form of capitalism, shouldn't there be a new form of corporate value? That was a question that one person raised. And the reason why he raised it is because he was, he's a CEO of a company and he feels like he's being always judged by the market cap of the company, meaning the financial value of the company. And as a CEO, he thinks, yeah, that's important, obviously, but there's other ways to, to you know, measure value. And I kind of pitched in after that and says, you know, there's lots of movements towards the uh, disclosure of non-financial assets with the ISSB in the, you know, in globally. Here within Japan, there, there's a move towards uh, impact measurement as well, and that's that's where I pitched in the word human capital actually, to to because that that's the you know measuring corporate value. Um, actually, the human capital part of the equation hasn't been valid here in Japan. Reason why I believe there are so many companies with you know uh, the price book ratio below 1.0. Um, PBR 1.0 basically means the market is valuing that company at its financial value. 1.0 over, that means it's premium, so there's lots of intangible value <coughs> that will be you know, realized in the future. A lot of the companies actually below PBR 1.0, which means you're, the, com the company's destroying the financial value of the company, which, which is a pretty severe message that the, you know, the market's sending to the Japanese, uh, J Japan Inc., basically. Um, but but another other side of that is basically that maybe Japan Inc. hasn't been good at disclosing that kind of intangible value of the company, and so there's some discussion about that. Uh, in terms of the uh, the wages, um, there wasn't really a, a real big pushback, even from the small small businesses. But in the smaller businesses, it's a little bit more, more much more fragmented with the companies that can afford to do that but other companies that they can't afford to do that. Um, there was a comment on energy, because obviously Japan Inc. needs energy. Um, and um, in, at the, when, when Prime Minister, actually I thought I was really surprised in the, in the final comments, um, you know, he's a Prime Minister that was born in, or his, comes from the Hiroshima district, right? Um, which there's lots of people nervous about nuclear power. Um, but, but he made a comment about you know, the starting to think about in the ne next generation, smaller nuclear um, you know, power generation, that kind of stuff. And, and so, so there was that, that kind of um, more of energy. Um, and there's this, um, it was both, both, both from the government as, as well as, as the, uh, the, the Japan, the business side, um, but it was this concept of economic security, the, the value chain that was, <clears throat> that was being disrupted by, by Corona and then by this Ukraine crisis. And so um, basically in alignment, there was an, and even the, the labor, the, the lingo kind, which is the labor union, um, they tend to be a little bit more, the, the, the chairman is a very nice person, but it was the comments was all, always read off a script. <laughs> and it seemed like, um, probably the more uh, conservative opinion of the 15 members I, I felt. Oh, and the reason why, the reason why is for, 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 wa for wages to increase. I think we, we were talking about stru structure reform. Um, the new form of capitalism actually is not going 
did not go deep into the structure reform. The reason why is there's only six months to come up with this plan. And for wages to structurally go up, yeah, you can talk about having tax incentives, that's fine. But unless you reform the labor law here in Japan to increase the liquidity in the labor market, I don't think you're going to have this you know, structural increase in wages. And, but we haven't gone that deep enough, I think. Just uh, one, um, one thing to add. I think um, uh, one important thing that we can see uh, the bigger corporation in Japan, including KDRN and, and those, uh, Keisei Doyukai, uh, they support this startup initiative, which was a surprise for me. Um, pleasant surprise, I must admit. And uh, even uh, Kate Andren suggested that Japan use, uses the pension uh, fund. Uh, there is a 5% uh, in the pension fund that is allocated for other investments, which will be used for the startup agenda and the new capitalism that's around $100 billion fund. Um, it's, it's interesting to see how will uh, the government decide to allocate these funds, where will these funds go, are they going to be supporting um, uh, in-house um, entrepreneurship and innovation and patent protection, and, uh, or are they going to uh, go through different channels and so forth. Uh, just it's good to see that um, maybe the beginning when new capitalism was announced, there was a lot of skepticism. Now we see a little by little buy-in on the side of the uh, corporation, and that's what you mentioned, the labor's, uh, labor union. They are also the one that need to come on board and to start negotiating uh, with corporations, not only about st job stability, because lifetime contract usually uh, the negotiation always is about job stability, but uh, start negotiating about um, wages and hikes in wages, which will um, translate, um, I mean, that's the hope, translate in uh, higher consumer spending uh, and, of course, higher revenues and increase the wages of uh, workers. Uh, so uh, these kind of discussions actually help uh, to raise the, the awareness of what this uh, new capitalism can do. Uh, however, I would like to see even more proactive role on the corporations in Japan because the, this initiative, that's why it's considered a little bit as a socialist uh, agenda. Uh, if it's um, one way, if, if the government uh, sort of uh, impose its will on the market, it might be a negative. But what if the whole society, the public and private sector come together uh, under this umbrella of this new initiative and um, with new ideas supporting initiatives that will um, actually foster growth, innovation, technology, and in startup, and of course, as I mentioned, and diversity, supporting diversity from both foreigners, uh, women, um, uh, elderly, participation in the market force, and so forth. But it, it, for this audience in particular, um, there is a, for startup and investment and venture capital, um, there is a specific mention that uh, it should include foreign capital or foreign venture fund investments and things like that. So there's nothing that I saw in the, in the plan that was, could be seen as protectionism, but rather working with our partners abroad whether it's you know, Britain or uh, all around the world to, to increase value. So, so um, that's a positive step, I think. Yes, um, I am, um, well, the, living through 80s, sometimes Japan was uh, commented as a, a uh, Japan as number one. And then uh, we looked really invincible, unassailable. Uh, in the 80s uh, in the area of the industrial power as such and then lost a decade, two decades, three decades and now. Um, I don't think uh, the concept of Japan Inc. is any more valid but at least if there is any point using the, this concept, I, th I would argue Japan Inc. is comprised of government and then uh, second consumers, household and then thirdly of course the private sector. You see, and then what is, uh, we, why we are discussing this, um, the, uh, the new capitalism in a way is I think, especially for us, the, this new capitalism is, in my view, is exhorting, exhorting three actors of economic activities uh, to gov government, to household, and to companies. And then to household is, as I said earlier, we, we've got to change your entrenched mindset 
that we cannot, uh, we cannot, we can't be anyway tolerant of inflation. That must change. And then also to the uh, corporations, you've got to regain your pricing power. Then I think you will be in a position to raise your wages. And then government, of course, must is invest more in human resources, and then more uh, sector-wise, of course, green transformation, digital transformation. So that, I think, is what is, I think, relevant, important. Yeah, my answer to that. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're running out of time, so I'd like to invite any more questions. And if there are a few questions, maybe we can, I'll take a few and then ask the panel to choose how they would like to answer. So here, at the front, please. Thanks very much. Um, it's a real privilege to be here, and uh, you're all fascinating speakers, so thanks for your time today. Um, so it was great to hear that uh, your foreign companies are you're probably included in, in the plan, in the startup fund you know, um, plans. And you know, just generally speaking, you know, I wonder to what extent um, you know, Japan is looking to you know, like bring foreign companies, you know, uh, you know, to their foreign direct investment in Japan. Um, there has been some very specific targets over the last, you know, um, since maybe 2013, you know, like, like uh, Japan's back those, those sorts of um, promotion, those sorts of strategies. Um, and yeah, they have been successful and, and, and they've hit their targets and exceeded their targets, I believe, in most cases. Um, and uh, just generally speaking, you know, I wonder how much uh, having foreign companies come to Japan and start shop, because I think it's a great place to start business. Um, the, uh, recent years have had a high level of stability, so these are uh, yeah, the stability of the Japan economy. Um, so I think these are sorts of things that Japan could actually use to, you know, it's 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 a um, it's, it's advantage. Um, you know, how much the bringing Japan companies into you know, the economy, uh, you know, you're figuring to, to, the, to the plans that, you know, to to make progress. And I also feel like this is something where we talk about getting younger people more involved. In the economy, um, I feel a little bit nervous saying this, but maybe the foreign startups might uh, be able to sort of set a bit of an example about how you can get, get young people involved in a company and you know, progressing up the ladder and leading, you know, progressing in the company. And can I ask you to hold your answers just for a second? I want to see if there are any more questions from the floor and take a few. So I think there's um, one at the back here and there's um, one here. Just a quick question. Um, I was kind of, it's interesting to hear comments, but um, I think the biggest weakness of Japan for innovation being a software company is uh, labor law. And so I was just curious if you're seeing, when they're talking about bringing innovation to Japan, I was kind of uh, sad because I thought if they don't change the labor law, then it's gonna, nothing's going to change. So I was just curious if you're seeing anything in that, any changes in that area. Okay, thank you. And then there's, I think there's two here, one here. And Uh, thanks for the fascinating discussion. Uh, my question is around um, corporate savings. Um, what, what tools does um, the Kishida administration have at its disposal uh, to ensure that corporate savings in Japan are funneled into wage rates and investment rather than just being hoarded? Sorry, I'm going to take this last question as well and then ask the panel to. <laughs> Thank you. We've got four great, great questions. <laughs> Not a lot of time. So can I please invite you, maybe one by one, to, to maybe pick up on some of these um, questions and try and uh, have a stab at them. Could, could Amasan, can we, should we start this end? Which one? Um, well, um, 
I think I can only um, pick up the labor law reform as well as the apathy issue. I can be very brief. As for the labor law reform, I think, uh, yes, um, we still have the kind of a dualism in a labor market. This remains, again, quite entrenched. So I think we, we have to change it. And again, um, I hope, uh, well, even, I think, well, in a way, uh, at the time of Prime Minister Koizumi, uh, in early 2000, I think, with uh, Mr. Takenaka Heizo, I think, in power at the helm, I think somehow uh, liberalized uh, the way to hire uh, the, the workers as uh, non-regular workers. But that has really, I think, uh, exacerbated the uh, income distribution, right? Inequality has deepened. So that must be, I think, addressed. At the same time, yes, and then, but here, for me, the real issue is, I think, still Japanese companies or maybe Japanese employees, employers, they all put top priority in the value of maintaining employment, you see. So unless, again, we tackle head on this too much emphasis on keeping employment, I mean, uh, the innovation or positive dis destruction, positive, I think, adjustment always is uh, Produce, produces, I think, uh, unemployment. So I think this is the key. Now, as for the apathy and the LDP, yes, good question, I think. Actually, recently I noticed, again, the governing parties, I think LDP seems to, in a way, is a truly inclusive party. If you really check their positions, interesting enough, of course, the liberal, um, liberal on a horizontal you know, axis, uh, to the left, liberalism, to the right, conservatism, and then also the importance of individualism and the importance of corporatism. I think I can tell you, LDP it has all these four you know, uh, positions. So that's the strength of, of LDP. But the importance is why the, you know, the um, opposition party, especially the, the Kim issue, that why they can't challenge this? But they haven't, they haven't presented their own alternative proposals. This is it, I think. Unless until they, they do, they haven't done their, for me, soul searching exercise of why they lost, not the power, they, why they lost the trust of voters. Unless they came, you know, come to terms with this issue. I think um, for the foreseeable future, I don't think there will be a change of government. But then uh, LDP will, in a way, uh, and then this is, this is the, the source of apathy, I think. So, um, but I think um, the LDP and uh, Mr. Moteki, I think, the, um, well, he's trying to, to galvanize the L intra LDP kind of thinking uh, to uh, present more alternative policies within the party maybe with Okometo, and then, in a way, uh, put it to uh, Prime Minister Kishida. This will be very interesting over the next three years. Yeah. Thank you. I would uh, like to answer about the foreign investment, um, just briefly. Um, attracting foreign investment in Japan, of course, has always been a high priority. However, the policies has not been aligned to answer to this ambition. Japan, uh, I think it's now 29 or 30 position on the uh, World Economic Forum Ease of Doing Business ranking. Um, Macedonia was number 11 when I was ambassador, so we were always laughing at that's why I know. We were always la laughing how we can reach that level. Well, Japan is also number at the, uh, 22nd on the digital talent. Uh, competitiveness is around 53 in the world ranking. So. In order to uh, attract this investment, Japan really, really need to align tax regulation, uh, other incentives for foreign businesses, including um, you know, cutting the red tape, having things done more digitally. So digital, digitalization is a big part of the process, how to attract people. And also to see, are we competitive in the region? Can we compete with Singapore and other hubs in the world in this regard. And I think somehow this issue has always been on the backside of the priorities 
of government and without the support of government and change in legislation, I mean, uh, um, uh, Prime Minister Kishida said that 40,000 legislations will be reviewed in the process of digitalization. Now, once the, the whole, both government and business will digitalize, 40,000 legislations will be reviewed and changed. So let's hope, uh, cross our fingers, <laughs> and let's hope the, that uh, the economy, free economic zones will become more prevalent and uh, that there will be more incentives for both Japanese businesses to reinvest here and foreign businesses to come and invest here. On the labor reform, as I mentioned before, just I'm going to be very brief why I think this is the key issue. Uh, investing in human capital is very important, training and uh, reskilling and upskilling, it's very, very important. However, the, the reform of the, of the labor reform, the entire reform of the system, which includes some cultural aspects for Japan. Lifetime employment is a cultural thing in Japan. The seniority system is a cultural thing, it's not written in any law. Uh, the seniority-based salary system is a cultural thing. So how you change that um, mentality, corporate culture, corporate values, what Ken mentioned, I think it's very important. And Japan can no longer uh, allow itself to have, um, we have now 72% of female participation uh, in the uh, work labor, okay? But 44% is part-time workers. So why is that? Of course, we all know there's lots of things, infrastructure from, um, you know, not enough available kindergarten schools and um, uh, daycare centers to uh, tax disincentives for women to be working and so forth. So tackling these issues, um, the sooner the better, because according to many um, research, including McKinsey, McKinsey says that if Japan increases the female work participation from part-time to full-time, uh, only 10%, it will contribute to, towards 15% of GDP growth in the, by 2030. So that should be really high uh, on the level of priorities on the government, including with other labor reforms that should be part of the uh, next phase of uh, structural reforms in the government. <laughs> well said. Thank you. So, <laughs> and so, finally, I'm afraid this has to be the last word. So I'd like to give the last word to Shibasawa-san, if you could uh, give us your thoughts. That'd be great. Uh, in terms of startups and foreign uh, work, um, Tokyo has tried to be trying to reclaim its former glory as the financial center of the Asia Pacific. So I mean, so I mean, the the the, the need for that kind of uh, investment from overseas is always here. Um, Japan's problem for the last thirty years has been stability, well, meaning the other place was growing. Japan was stable. That was a problem. Um, but stability right now looks like a pretty good deal. Um, and, and guess what? The yen's getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So I think there's a lot of value out, out there. Um, and so I think um, for foreign investors um, that's been out of Japan for a long time should really take another look because I think there's lots of good, I mean, you look at, to me, you look at Japan on the macro, the aggregate, it's a very, very boring economy. But if you look at the micro, what's going on, there's lots, lots of interesting things here going on, I think. Uh, the labor reform law, um, I said <coughs> in the in the council, this is this is the key. I mean, unless we change this, that you know, we're not going to have this structural wage increase. Um, I agree with it's cultural, but I think it's a post-war cultural thing. Before the war, I mean, there wasn't anything like lifetime employment and seniority. Yeah, it existed in society, but in business, probably not. Um, there's lots of you know liquidity in the labor market. Um, but because of the instability after the war, this was the Japan Inc., right? The, 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 the companies became social welfare uh, institutions. They, they provided the security for, for the post-war period. And this, the labor reform law is basically an extension of that, basically a manufacturing-based value creation model. So, you know, you have unit of production during a unit time. <clears throat> so everything is based on time rather than actually the value created especially in the, in the current service. Um, um, I mentioned this several times. The secretary says, yeah, we understand that. Startup has also been complaining about this law, but, but we can't touch it <coughs> because there's lots of, lots of people that will resist. And so people realize it <coughs> within the government, but, but they feel it's, a, it's, a, it's a too big of a, especially with the current um, situation where, as I mentioned, Kishida's positioning wasn't so strong, 
that wasn't a, that wasn't a political strategy that they can go forward. But maybe you know af after the elections that that might change. But there there is a recognition that that, that this is that is a problem. Uh, the, the the cash and the corporate balance sheet. Um, the incentives are tax incentives. So if you raise wages, <coughs> um, that that portion that's raised, you can write write it off in your earnings. So so there's. Uh, uh, incentives there's I don't think that's probably enough and so basically I think we just need pressure from the capital markets and saying that hey what do you got why do you have so much cash on your balance sheet and so um, I'm thinking maybe eventually we need to tax cash here in Japan <laughs> because including individuals we own so much cash that you know basically um, but I mean you know inflation is basically taxing right it's a hidden tax and, and but you know our, our cash balance is in, you know is increasing, so we probably need to visualize what that tax is by actually taxing the gases. Um, in terms of empathy, or, well, not empathy, uh, the, uh, the, not empathy, apathy. Lots of apathy here in Japan, but you have to remember. That, but there are there are young people that are very very um, energized to create a new society. Um, there are people that are want to increase the political awareness of their generation. Um, so I wouldn't write off the younger people as being totally apathetic, totally clueless, because there's lots of lots of very, very brilliant young people here in Japan. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answers. I'm afraid I'm going to have to cut off our um, discussion now. But thank you all to the audience for your very, very wonderful um, questions. Thank you. That was great. And um, here at the British Chamber of um, Commerce in Japan, we aim to bring you the people who matter. And part of the way that we do that is through having opportunities for you to meet um, other of our fantastic members. And the other thing is to bring expert insight and commentary um, on issues that are facing us all. And I think this session with our really wonderful speakers has really uh, fulfilled that um, part of our objective. So I'd like to ask you to join me in giving a huge um, round of applause of thanks to our three wonderful panelists. <laughs>